Dreams. Tonight, the obsession of a young Adelaide student catapults her into publishing celebrity. With a global bidding contest for her book, and there's even talk of a Hollywood movie. The unlikely subject of this overnight bestseller is a woman beheaded for murder in Iceland in 1830. As the young author Hannah Kent reveals tonight, her 10-year dedication to the story of Agnes Magnus' daughter has taken her to strange and unexpected places. This is her story. In 1828, in the midnight hours between the 13th and 14th of March, an isolated farm on the Vatsnes Peninsula in Iceland, the farmers who lived there, the servants who lived there, were woken up by a woman, Agnes Magnus Dottir, um, knocking on the door. She explained that the farm where she lived and worked, a place called Lugastar there, which was the neighbouring farm, but at some distance away, stood in bright flames. And that the master of the farm, the farmer, a man called Nathan Kettleson, and also another guest that was staying there for night were trapped inside. In the morning, as it slowly grew light, the farmer at Stapakoti examined the bodies more closely and he found some things that made him a little suspicious. He didn't think it was a sort of a straight run-of-the-mill accident as Agnes had described it. He found stab, what he thought were stab wounds on the corpses of the men and he also thought he saw what looked like blood on remnants of unburnt clothing. And when I heard people use the word monstrous in connection to Agnes and her actions, there was part of me that thought, but not no one's really a monster. When I first started writing, I was incredibly frustrated by the absence of information on Agnes's life. When I did find information about Agnes, I was really struck by the way that she was almost always presented in unequivocal terms. As the cold-blooded murderess, as the, you know, Lady Macbeth behind the scenes, rubbing her hands together in glee and plotting death and destruction for everyone. I was very intrigued and I read the first maybe three, four pages and knew straight away that she was brilliant on the page and knew actually that I was going to end up buying it. It's highly unusual to have a book spread around the world like this so quickly. It was like wildfire and the buzz, you could just hear it, you know, in the industry here and it, you, we were hearing it from overseas as well so it was really quite amazing. It was very, very grueling getting the rights to the manuscript. And I remember at one point turning to the publisher and saying to him, if I don't get this book, I am just going to lie on the floor behind my desk and never get up. I mean, that is how much you know, I wanted, wanted the book. The year after I finished high school, I went to Iceland on a rotary exchange. I grew up in the Adelaide Hills and I had never seen snow before. The first few months were very difficult for me. I left a very hot Adelaide summer and arrived in January in the midst of an Icelandic winter. It was dark for 20 hours a day and I found the darkness incredibly claustrophobic. And I really do think that there was something in that strange isolated landscape that reminded me of my own emotional state. I don't think she completely revealed everything to us because she didn't want us to worry. But I do remember after one particular conversation when she was, she was down, I just wanted to jump on a plane and go over there. Absolutely, I did. It would have been the worst thing and maybe Agnes wouldn't have happened had, had we done that. So uh, I'm glad I didn't. 
we were driving through these long sweeping valley lands and then we came to an area, it was a valley mouth, where the land suddenly rose up in what looked like hundreds of small hills. And I remember asking my host mother if they were indeed burial mounds and she said, oh no, it's just the way the land is. But she did say, those three hills over there are called Tristapa. And it was there, well over a hundred years ago, that the last execution occurred in Iceland. And she told me that it had been a woman who had been beheaded for her role in the murder of two men. And that was the first time I heard of Agnes Magnus Dottir. The Agnes story remained with me even when I came back to Australia and did a creative writing degree and then later a PhD. I tell my PhD student, pick a subject that you're passionate about because this is going to be with you for four years. You've got to be passionate about it. And that was certainly the case with Hannah when she started writing. Well, she does sound a little bit Icelandic. Hannah and I met in 2009. Um, I asked her what she did and she told me that she was writing a book. So then she started to go into um, how she went to exchange in Iceland um, and about Agnes, and I just remember being like, whoa. I told myself I would find out all the facts, as many facts as I could, about Agnes Magnus Dottir and about Iceland at that time, and that I would stay true to all known facts. I think it's actually interesting that no scholar or, or a novelist here in Iceland has really, you know, delved into this and, and, and written about Agnes and these crimes because it is a really interesting story. But when you, you start to research it, you find out that there isn't that much material that you can find on the facts. Two years into my research, I became incredibly frustrated about the absence of information on Agnes's life. I knew a great deal about 19th century Iceland, but with Agnes I only knew four facts. I knew her name, that she was a servant, I knew the date of her death, and I knew that her father was a man called Magnus. I started to panic because I had no idea how I could find the extra information about Agnes I needed. So what I started to do instead was imagine what her life might be like. The fact of the case is that two men were murdered, Nathan Ketilsson, a farmer and a master at Itluastadir and Agnes's boss, and another man who happened to be staying there at the time, and that the house was set on fire after the murders. They will say Agnes and see the spider, the witch caught in the webbing of her own fateful weaving. They might see the lamb circled by ravens, bleating for a lost mother, but they will not see me. What I was interested in finding out was what Agnes's life had looked like before the crime. I was much more interested in finding out why she had ended up in that particular situation rather than protesting her guilty conviction. My aim in writing this book is not to make Agnes necessarily an object of sympathy. What I've really striven for is an empathetic representation of a woman who was deeply complex. Three people were convicted in a local court for the murders. A uh, neighbouring farmer, Friedrich Sigurdsson, a young serving girl, Sigrid Gummestotter, and Agnes Magnusdottir. They were sentenced to be executed by beheading. You. Agnes Magnus Dottir have been sentenced to death. You, Magnus, Agnes, they don't know me. I imagined that she would have a younger brother. I thought that she would be very intelligent and that despite being a servant, she would be incredibly literate. And I also imagined her being visited by a very young priest. I was very limited in terms of what I could research and find in Australia, so I was very fortunate that I received funding to go to Iceland for six weeks of intensive archival research. And I also invited uh, my mum and dad to come for a part of that with me. So where are we, mum? Where are we off to? The site. <laughs> she was quite obsessed, really, with, with the story. Do you reckon this was the house? Well, 
Makes sense really, doesn't it? And that was the purpose for her visit, so it's understandable as well. But I think she was obsessed, as, anyway, <laughs> with Agnes. I went into the National Museum and saw the axe and the chopping block used in the execution, which have been preserved to this day. I was able to finally get my hands on the, on the primary sources. I was able to eventually track her through all these sort of parish archives, through to different farms that she was working at. I discovered the fact of her illegitimacy through her birth record. I found a description of her from when she was in custody. And it wasn't a great deal of information, but they said that she had darker hair, that she had a long face, that she was very slender. There was the events that occurred in the 20th century when a psychic in Reykjavik contacted people around the area of Alugastadir, telling them that a woman called Agnes had contacted her and that she would like her bones to be moved from the site of execution where they were buried to consecrated ground. there was no marker saying where exactly the bones were and the woman said that she would ask Agnes and together they went out and they found the bones she led them to where they lay and they dug them up and they moved them to the churchyard of Tjern where they now stand I think it's that one over there at the churchyard we went in and um, it was all pretty solemn really but um, we walked around quietly and finally found the grave where um, Agnes and the other um, person executed was buried. But something else I knew was sort of awaiting me in Iceland that I couldn't get my hands on while I was still in Australia was a book called Ingima Undanlita, which means no one may look away. And I knew that there was a chapter on Agnes Magnus dot here. I couldn't order it from anyone. Um, so I knew I was I was banking on my hopes on finding it at this at these libraries. Unfortunately, I could find it in none of them. And of course, I was absolutely devastated. You know, you spend two years trying to find out all this information about someone who's really no more than a ghost to you. And suddenly, you know, my hopes were dashed. I've got my suspicions that she came back and lived here. On our last day of seeing Hannah, the three of us went to this beautiful peninsula. She wanted to stay in, a, in an isolated place and just focus on her writing. I finally arrive and the farmer, Knutter, comes up and greets me and then sort of says, what, what brings you here, you know? And I explained that I was writing a book and he asked me what the book was about and I said it was about Agnes Magnus Dottir and had he heard of her and her story and he said, oh yes, he was quite familiar with the, with the murders and with the story of the execution, that it was a terrible story. I must admit I was a bit surprised to meet Hannah and that the story that she was uh, studying and how much she knew about this. But then again, I'm not surprised that people are interested in this old story. This old story has, this bad old story has all the elements to interest people and move people. I do believe that the execution of Agnes is still an unhealed wound in Iceland, in the history of Iceland. That night I was unpacking all my papers and all my notebooks and there's this polite little rap on the door and I open it up and it's Knutur. And he's standing there in his overalls from milking his cows and he says, look, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I know you came here to work, but I was wondering if, uh, if this book might be of interest to you. And he handed me a copy of Engin Maun Danlita. Uh, this book tells about the difficult, difficult conditions of Agnes Magnus daughter, her childhood, her upbringing, she was an orphan, her struggle throughout her short life and her, her difficult conditions. And together we'd sit at this table and talk until the small hours also about the murders and about the very tragic nature of it all. 
about motivation, about the way in which Agnes may well have been misrepresented over the years. In some ways it could be perceived as a fanciful notion that Agnes herself has been guarding Hannah. But there, there have been a lot of coincidences that have been weird and almost too weird to just put down to mere coincidence. Knutter actually helped me translate a great deal of Engelmann and Lita. And due to many of our conversations, our late night conversations at OSA, I realised that many of my original instincts about Agnes were in fact absolutely correct. She was literate, she was intelligent, she did have a younger brother, five years younger than her, as I originally thought. And interestingly, she was also attended by a very young assistant priest. I don't know if it's fate or just dumb luck that it just, that it just happened. And it, and it was a fantastic point for her, I think, and a, and, a, and a turning point because, you know, that place really, really solidified what she had to do in the process afterwards. When I got back to Australia, uh, the clock was ticking and I had to finish my thesis. So I had to become very disciplined. The story of Agnes would be speculative biography. She coined that phrase herself to really describe what she was doing in the book. She was taking a few known historical facts and weaving a whole story around them. And it was filling in the historical gaps, if you like. When it came to write the crime scene, I had to rely on a logic of imagination. One of the problems with this story is that it's so difficult to weed out the facts from the fiction. Take for example the, the imagined love triangle which is in the book, the relationship between Agnes and the man she worked for, Nathan Kettleson. I cannot remember not knowing Nathan. I cannot think of what it was not to love him. To look at him and realise I had found what I had not known I was hungering for. A hunger so deep, so capable of driving me into the night, that it terrified me. Nathan was in some ways an unusual man. He is said to have been bright and charismatic. He was a medicine man but he's also said to have been an unscrupulous businessman and a notorious womanizer. We know for a fact that Agnes went to work for Nathan. The theory is that when Agnes had been living there for some time, she lost his affections, that is Nathan's affections, and he transferred them to Siri, the young servant girl, and so she is supposed to have been a woman scorned. They said I must die. They said that I stole the breath from men, and now they must steal mine. And I'll never forget finishing that first draft. I was writing and then I realised with some small amount of surprise that there was nothing left to write. I'd finished the first draft, it was actually done. There were no more scenes, no more dialogue. And I remember I sort of put my hands in my lap and all of a sudden I just burst into tears and I just sobbed. I got a call on my mobile and, and it was Hannah and she was absolutely sobbing. Um, and my, my immediate reaction was, who's died? And in this really small sobbing voice, she just said, Agnes, Agnes has died. I finished the book in May and it wasn't until October that I picked it up again and that was because a friend of mine recommended that I enter this new Writing Australia Unpublished Manuscript Award. Before Hannah gets her $10,000 prize money, <laughs> boy are you going to have friends. <laughs> And once that happened, the publishers started coming to Hannah. She didn't have to go to them. So that was how it all started. In my job, I see hundreds of manuscripts a year, but this one immediately stood out. And I was just like, how can a 26-year-old know this much about 
how it feels to grieve, how it feels to love this deeply. And I thought, wow, this woman is a really old soul. I was surprised by the publisher's auction and the frenzy and the, and the huge numbers that were being bandied about and so forth. I was reading for work, I read the financial review and I was reading this article and I was going, that's Hannah. And then I flicked back on the front page and there's a little colour photograph in the top right hand corner saying, student, bidding war for students first novel. So yeah, that blew me away a bit. I think I was just shocked that people wanted to publish it at all. I was, um, I remember just thinking that it was all very, very surreal. And I'd had these strange moments where it felt as though all of this, the auctions and so on, was happening to a very dear friend of mine. And I was very, very happy for her. But it wasn't me. It wasn't happening to me. And I still get feelings like that occasionally. Look, the success that Hannah's now experiencing is mind-blowing. It's a story that needed to be told. And perhaps Hannah was the one through some strange means of which we mere human can understand as was the chosen one to tell it, really. I think it's probably very unusual for somebody this young to have gotten this much attention and not just as an, you know, an American deal, but globally and to have sold in however many countries, 20 something countries I think that this book has sold all around the world, it's uh, extremely rare. And after the book comes out in the, in the UK and in the States this year, it'll be coming out in Iceland probably next year along with, the, along with many other countries in Europe. And it'll be very interesting to see how it's received. In many ways, it's my dark love letter to Iceland. I expect the book to be well received because it is an interesting story. Uh, what is interesting is that it took an Australian to write the book. And soon your bones, now hot with blood and thick juicy with marrow, will be dry and brittle and flake and freeze and thaw with the weight of the dirt upon you. It was in January 1830 that the day came for Agnes and Friedrich to be executed and by that time the young serving girl, Sigrid, who was only 16, her sentence had been commuted to life imprisonment. So it was only Agnes and Friedrich who were led to their deaths. Friedrich was executed first. I found several sources that referred to the fact that he was very calm about his execution, that he had accepted it and then he knelt down and was beheaded in one stroke by Guðmundo Kettleson, Nathan's brother. It's interesting when it comes to Agnes. There's the official account, which I guess in the spirit of Friedrich's death, say that they were both content to walk out to their fates. You also have other stories of the execution which say that she fainted and that there's some which say they weren't sure whether she was even conscious when she was beheaded again with one stroke of the axe then there's others that say that she lost control of her bowels others that say that she was hysterical and I think having that contradiction between the official report and the the local accounts it's clear that it wasn't as easy for her as it was for Friedrich, that right until the end she had not come to terms, as they said, with her fate. It was January when Harry and I went to the execution site and it was incredibly cold and incredibly icy. We're trying to walk and I bought Icelandic boots and Han was um, really stubborn and just kept her normal boots that she wore. And I look behind me and Han's trying to walk in my footsteps, but there's no grip in her shoes, so she keeps slipping. And I literally, like, I turned around and it was so eerie because Han was on her hands and knees at the execution site, not being able to walk. 
I started crying because I was in so much pain. And I think it just gave me a real sensory, I guess, impression of what she would have suffered being led out there to that execution block and just how physical and horrible and, un and I guess, um, and, and painful and, and emotional that would have been for her. And I just, I just couldn't help thinking, I wonder if that's how Agnes felt. I went over and she was like, I can't do it, I can't walk. I can't walk up. So I went up and, um, uh, and took some photos of the execution site and we got in the car and we just wept in the car. Now comes the darkening sky and a cold wind that passes right through you, as though you are not there. It passes through you as though it does not care whether you are alive or dead, for you will be gone, and the wind will still be there. I was so immersed in her story, and to some extent I still feel like I carry her in some way. You can't let go of people like that. Still so young to travel so far And old enough to know who you are Wise enough to carry the scars Without any blame There's no one to blame It's easy to forget what you learn Waiting for the thrill to return 